program is called Moving Pictures and Grand Theaters Picture Palaces, which many of these really are. I want to go back and talk about the origin of movies, period. And then we'll talk about some of the theaters. So the gentleman in the picture here should look familiar to you. This is Thomas Edison, one of our most famous, in fact, uh, probably the greatest inventor in the history of the world. He's going to invent a lot of things, light bulb primarily among them, but also the phonograph. And he's going to do movie projectors. Actually, Edison isn't the man who invented the, well, he's, he invented the idea. He had the idea. But if you know anything about Edison's story, he turns a lot of his projects over to people who work for him in the Edison lab. And in this case, he had this idea for moving pictures. He turned that over to a man named William Dixon. And so in 1889, Dixon begins work on this. And what he comes up with, and Edison, of course, gets the patent for it, by the way, as he did so many other things. Edison, if you're not familiar with this, had over a thousand patents, by far the most in our history. George Westinghouse, by the way, from Western Pennsylvania was second to Edison. But it's called a kinetoscope. It was first produced for mass audiences in 1891. And so Kineto has to do with viewing, kinetic, motion, uh, and scope. That's the viewing part. So kinetic from the Greek, motion, and scope meaning viewing. So that's the idea here. You're going to watch a film or watch a motion picture. The kinetograph has to do with recording. We have to have something to record these films. And so that's where you get the kinetograph, Greek for recording. So you put these two things together and now you have films that can be viewed going back to the kinetoscope, look at the inside, and you can see there's a series of rollers there. And that's the actual film that you're looking at. It was 35 millimeter film. For those of you of a certain age, I know I'm not talking to the younger, younger folks in the audience, but you might kind of recognize what's on the left side there. Uh, back when I started teaching, we were still using film strips. <laughs> so I'll be curious if anybody at the end remembers those days. But in any case, in this case, in, in a film strip like this, we're going to have it rolling on wheels. And instead of somebody just turning it by hand, there's actually a machine that's going to rotate it. And the idea was this 35 millimeter film strip is going to be a continuous loop. And so when you're looking into the scope, that's what you see. One of the very first ones that was produced is shown here on the left. It was called the Butterfly Dance. And as soon as you started looking into the scope, this would continue to roll. And kind of like uh, what you can do with fans and make them those flip books, make them look like they're rolling and moving. That's what this basically amounts to. So the very first actual movie is also going to come in 1894 that I have to show you. And this is Fred Ott's Sneeze. That is actually a film. Now you can see that Fred is going to sneeze for about three seconds. And then we're going to continue to see Fred doing the exact same thing over and over again. These were experiments. They really weren't intended for anybody to watch them. You can make them at this time, though, that are going to last about 20 to 30 seconds. And so that was enough to intrigue people to the point where they would go to kinetoscope parlors. And the owner of the parlor would have a series of these machines, usually 10 of them, showing different films. And people would pay, obviously, to maybe look at one or more of these films in these boxes. You can see the scope on the top kind of like the old Viewmaster, you just put your face down there and you'll be able to see the projected image inside of that machine. And at a phone, added sound. Phone, again, is the Greek for sound, phono. 
And so here you have a man looking into a kinetoscope, but you see the wires that are coming out of the kinetoscope box, and that's earphones, very much like what they still are today. So you have the combination there of sound with the pictures. It's not on the same reel, though. It's actually two separate things, but they're synchronized so that the sound and the picture play together at the same rate. And so it sounds like an actual talking picture. It's not like the talking picture that we're thinking of later on where they're on the same actual reel. That's 1895. In 1895, one of the great breakthroughs in this technology is going to actually occur in France with Augusta and Louis Lumiere. And they are going to invent a motion picture projector. And this is what they're calling the cinematograph, the cinematograph. I think I'm, I, I need to put that better together better. But in any case, the Lumiere brothers are going to kind of revolutionize the industry because now what is great about this is that the screen can be one screen, one machine, and one film, as opposed to a parlor where you have 10 machines, you constantly have to maintain them, and people can only look at one thing at a time. Now you can have lots of people looking at the same film. So it's obviously much less expensive for those who have theaters who want to have these things available for their patrons. And also, it is uh, lots more money for those theater owners. Uh, by the way, I wanted to mention also that uh, just a few years earlier than that, one of the first films that was shown from the kinetoscopes uh, actually was at the World's Fair, the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. So we're again going ahead to the time of the Lumieres and the one of the very first films, and it lasted a few minutes, was A Trip to the Moon. This is a great example of early uh, films. And it was 1902. George Melier, based on the Jules Verne novel, they're going to take a trip to the moon. It's only a few minutes long, but it demonstrates the idea of having this projected image on a screen where people can all look at it at the same time. Here's Edison's version of that same machine one year later. Needless to say, he doesn't want to be outdone by the Lumieres. Uh, interesting aside, uh, for those of you who recognize that name Lumiere and trying to figure out why, it's from Beauty and the Beast. When Disney created the movie version of the story Beauty and the Beast, one of the characters was Lumiere the candle. And that's an homage to the great film producers in France who created motion pictures. Sometimes Disney does that in films. It's, it's really kind of a fun thing. One of the early feature films of any length, it was about, I think, 10 minutes, 15 minutes long, is actually an Edison film, The Great Train Robbery. And now we're going to have people actually become movie stars, if you will. 1903, Justice D. Barnes was the main cowboy in The Great Train Robbery produced by Edwin Porter using an Edison machine. At this point, there are problems with these parlors that people have. You have all these machines and parlors, that's fine. But when you go to projectors, now you have this 35 millimeter film. Well, obviously, many of you know, if you're familiar with old movies, especially back in school, again, when I started in school, and even when I was first teaching in school, we had projectors, and they had film on the reels. That film is very flammable. Early kinetoscope parlors were basically storefronts, and that wasn't a problem. It didn't matter what kind of place you put these projectors in, it would be fine. But now when you have projector film, it is extremely flammable and that causes a problem because these theaters are almost all in cities. And so the fire codes 
are going to come into play here. And cities are going to very quickly regulate this and essentially say no more storefront theaters showing projected films. You have to build a building that's going to meet fire codes. You can't just stick it anywhere. Well, they're going to be very popular very quickly. And this is one of the very first purpose-built theaters in the entire world. This is Tally's Theater in Los Angeles, built in 1902. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is Tally's Electric Theater. This is the inside of the theater, what it looked like. So again, very much like theaters of today. It's amazing how similar they really are. By the 1920s, skipping ahead just a little bit, uh, these theaters are going to be showing a variety of different types of films as they were able to make them longer and longer. The, in fact, the only thing that after you have uh, these movies on continuous reels of 35 millimeter film, the only thing that limits the length of the movie is the size of the reel. And so what ends up happening is very quickly, you're going to have people sort of develop uh, a, a similar system in all of these theaters where they will have a couple of very short films. And then news uh, people got into the act. They realized that they could go out and actually take moving pictures. And then they would produce newsreels to sell. And those would be shown in the theater. And then maybe you would have a very short couple of trailers for upcoming features. And then you would have a feature film. A couple of short films could be 10, 20 minutes. And then the feature film might be as long as 80 minutes. Again, not really too different than what we have now. And the only thing that these theater owners needed to keep in mind was that you wouldn't necessarily always have movies. So many of these theaters were built with a vaudeville stage, an actual live performance stage at the same time in the same building. Here in Pittsburgh, or in our area, Pittsburgh, PA, a fellow named Harry Davis in 1905 is going to build the very first theater that takes the name Nickelodeon. And I'm sure most of you have heard that name. Of course, it's a cable channel nowadays, but you've heard the name and probably familiar with the idea that the name comes from the fact that it's five cents to get in. And Odeon is Greek word for theater. So it's a five cent theater, a Nickelodeon. That's the origin of the term. And this is the very first one that took that name in the entire country in Pittsburgh on Smithfield Street. Here it is in the interior shot. Again, very much like theaters today. They're, you know, it's amazing when you look at these old ones, how similar they are to what we're used to seeing now. So I wanna transition to the idea that you can now build, if you're building buildings anyway, it's kind of like refrigerators, the bigger it is, it doesn't necessarily cost that much more. And the bigger it is, and the bigger the screen, the more people you can get in the building. And so this is where we really get into what we call the picture palaces. These are unbelievable, uh, just gorgeous theaters. Going to start seeing these in the early teens of the 20th century. This is one of the very first ones. This is the region which was built in 1914. It's in Patterson, New Jersey. You can see the car out in front of the theater. This is the inside of the Regent Theater. 1,949 people, and that just kind of really is astounding to me. We're talking about a theater built in 1914, holds almost 2,000 people. I mean, yeah, we're used to that now, but a century ago, pretty crazy. Well, there it is, the Regent in Patterson, New Jersey. Naturally, the place to be very quickly in the 19 teens and the early 20s develops the film industry out in, in uh, Los Angeles, in California. It was the place to be. And so Sid Grauman is going to build this theater in Los Angeles. It was known as the Million Dollar Grand. And 
the name is literal. It cost a lot of money to build this building. 1917, the million dollar grand. Uh, what a gorgeous theater on the inside. By 1927, Grauman has decided to go in a different direction in terms of the outer decor of his theaters. And so, and kind of an homage, I guess, to the Chinese influence in California, he builds Grauman's Chinese Theater. And if any of you have heard the name, it's because of the Walk of Fame, which was originally located outside of this theater. And this one was built in 1927. A revolution is going to occur in the theater business due to this man, John Eberson, a photograph of him in 1912. And starting in the early 20s until 1950, Eberson is going to build hundreds of theaters all over the country. And many of them are going to be a really unique style of theater on the inside. They become known as atmospheric theaters. And you're looking here at an actual photograph of the inside of the theater. That blue is not a background that's being superimposed on this photograph. That's actually the wall of the theater blending into the ceiling of the theater. It goes all the way over top of you as you're sitting there. And what is really amazing about these theaters is that they're not only going to be available to project the movie on the a stage, but the ceiling of the theater moves uh, in terms of there's there's a projection of an image up there on this atmospheric theater. You'll see a better picture of it later on. The Majestic is one of the first. In fact, I, it was the first in 1923. It was built in Houston, Texas. There's only 16 of these theaters left in the United States. It was originally over 100 built, most of them by Eberson. He was the designer, kind of the great architect of theaters at this time period. We have two of them, not far away from where we are right now. Unless, of course, you might be watching this, watching this program from somewhere far distant. But if you're in Western Pennsylvania, they're actually quite close to us. The first one I want to show you is in Canton, Ohio. It's the Palace. And this was built in 1926. It is still there. This is obviously the, a nighttime shot of the palace in Canton. An interior view. These are sumptuous. All of the decor inside is just a feast for the eyes. And now you can kind of picture yourself sitting in those seats. And if you look up at the ceiling, you can see it's all dark up there. But there's a really unique kind of a pattern of architecture behind the seats up in the balcony section. And it almost makes it look like you're sitting in the Colosseum or something similar to that. This is an even better view. It gives you a sense of what it would be like to sit down in the lower area and look up beyond the balcony up at the ceiling. And it is visible through all of those arches up there. There's another one in Akron, Ohio, and it is called the Civic. The original name was Lowe's Theater in Akron. This was built in 1929. By the way, I've been in the Canton Theater and it was really an experience. I had no idea what an atmospheric theater was at the time. And I was sitting there mesmerized by the ceiling moving. There's images up there. It looked like it was clouds at night moving on the ceiling. So the, anyway, this one is in uh, Akron, and it's the Akron Civic Theater. This gives you a better sense of what you're looking at when you're sitting in these theaters. It actually looks like stars or clouds or whatever they want to project up on that ceiling. And you can see just how gigantic this appears to be. It's a very large theater and therefore a very large ceiling. Once again, look at the top of the image here and you're looking through some of that gorgeous decor 
that surrounds the main stage here. Most of these theaters now do not show movies, although they do occasionally, uh, or they may show a mixture, but a lot of them use their theater stages for live performances now, those that have survived, like the one in Akron and Canton. And here you get probably the best view of what the ceiling looks like. And if you can imagine sitting there and watching it move, it really keeps you entertained before the show starts, I'll tell you that. This one, in Akron um, is going to hold 2,592 people, 2,600 people in that theater. That's gigantic. Uh, the one in Canton is not nearly that big, but it still holds over 1,000, I believe. So lots of people. This is obviously a view of the lobby area in the theater. Uh, I mean, they're just gorgeous in their decoration. One of the really fascinating things about this one is it's being renovated. And I would love to see an up-to-date photograph of this. I've never been to this theater, but this was as of 2001. And I want to point out in this photograph that the section that you're looking at first, the, the gold section down there, that has been repainted. That's now restored. But where I have a circle there, the rest of it, which looks kind of dull and dingy, it's not restored yet. And so you can very definitely see the difference between those. So this theater is under restoration. What you have in front of you here is an illustration of what they want it to look like in downtown Akron at some point in the future. We're not there yet. That is what it actually looks like. Now, I'm not sure how recent this picture is. It may have been, you know, more of the block has been uh, renovated by now, but at one point, years ago, that is what it looked like. The theater basically was all that was left there in that area. Talk about the history of some of the companies. 1904, Marcus Lowe is going to start one of the first of these companies that are gonna produce movies. The photograph that you see here is uh, in 1914 of Marcus Lowe, and his company was called Lowe's Cineplex Entertainment. There are going to be others. Uh, one of those companies is Metro Pictures, 1919. And then there's another company called the Goldwyn Picture Company. And this is illustrated in 1924. Several of these companies are going to begin to struggle and they're going to nearly go out of business. And what happens is someone swoops in and takes advantage of that situation. His name was Louis B. Mayer. And Louis B. Mayer is going to combine three different companies, and he's going to produce a gigantic motion picture, uh, gigantic you know company out of that. And of course, we would recognize those names today in this fashion: Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Beginning in 1924, that company is now a single company. There are three other companies that are competing with these two that we've talked about, Lowe's and MGM. There's the Paramount, the Fox, and the Warner Brothers. Between those five, they were known as the Big Five, they controlled 70% of the filmmaking market in the entire country. Paramount had 1,200 theaters. Fox had 1,100. So you get the sense of just how big this was. In Pittsburgh, Lowe's had one that was built in 1927 called the Lowe's Penn Theater. You'll recognize it in just a minute as something different because in the 1940s and the 50s, there was a effort made in Pittsburgh led by this man, Jack Hines, and two people who joined with him in this effort, David L. Lawrence, the mayor of Pittsburgh, and Richard King Mellon of the Mellon family. Almost anywhere that you have any important civic project in Pittsburgh or even in Western Pennsylvania generally, I have learned through my research for many, many different programs. If you go behind the scenes, there's a very, very good chance you will see the name Mellon associated with it. 
They don't often put their name on it, but they are behind it. It's amazing how often they get involved in these projects. Jack Hines, the heir to the Hines fortune. Of course, many of you are familiar with that company still to this day, Hines Field or now Acrisure Stadium. But in any case, these three men are going to begin to promote what we refer to today as the Pittsburgh Renaissance in 1945. This is a time when Pittsburgh is known as the Smoky City. This view of Pittsburgh that you're looking at right now would have been impossible in 1945. Uh, first of all, those buildings wouldn't have been there, but the point is the skies would not have been that blue, except on very occasionally rare uh, days in Pittsburgh. It's almost impossible to picture Pittsburgh looking like this, but it does now. And one of the reasons is because these three men had a vision for recreating the downtown area, which was essentially a series of warehouses, docks, and just all sorts of industrial construction in that area between the three rivers. So there are going to be two phases to the Renaissance. The first one is going to create Point State Park, but there's going to be a second one that is going to get involved in the renovation and the revitalization of the theater area in downtown Pittsburgh, which at one time, and I can even remember this, many of you might be able to remember when Pittsburgh, especially Liberty Avenue, was sort of the, the place in Pittsburgh you really didn't want to go down into at night. That's no longer the case. And the reason is because of tremendous amounts of money that were put into this effort by many of these philanthropy uh, organizations, and especially those families. So by 1971, for instance, we have rebuilt that theater that you saw a moment ago as Heinz Hall. That's what it is now. Inside Heinz Hall, many of you might have been there. This is much about what it would have looked like as a movie theater, but of course, it's been completely redesigned inside and all of the decor is now different. 2,700 people nearly uh, can take seats at Heinz Hall. It is, of course, the home of the Pittsburgh Symphony, one of the great symphonies in the entire United States, and a place where there are many, many excellent programs, not just the symphony, but many, many other types of theater presentations are done at Heinz Hall. It is literally one of the landmarks of downtown Pittsburgh today. You can see here the ceiling of the Heinz Hall and all of those light fixtures up there. There's a little bit of a close up of some of those lights in the ceiling. Here we have the lobby area on the upper level, the balcony and some of the staircases, gorgeous gorgeous buildings inside. A feast for the eyes, as they say. Another one of the theaters in Pittsburgh was called the Stanley. And it also has been given new life by the people that we were talking about moments ago. Here you see a view of the Stanley when it was a movie theater back in the old days. This is what it would have looked like in 1928. Again, it's a movie theater at this point. But later on, as you see an interior shot here, the Stanley, like many of these movie theaters, is going to run into problems, financial trouble. By 1936, which uh, this view shows, we have the nation in the midst of the Great Depression. And these gigantic movie theaters, these picture palaces are all struggling to survive. The viewership of movie goers in the 1930s plummeted just off a cliff. And so how, when you have a theater this gigantic, do you even keep the lights on in the time of the Great Depression when hardly anybody can even afford to go to a movie? It becomes very difficult. And so many of these theaters are going to really go downhill, and this part of town is going to go downhill with them. So the Stanley, shown here in years later, like many of these, is going to be on hard times. 
And so finally, it is also going to be a part of this revitalization. Here in 1984, you see the cultural district advertised there in that photograph. All of these different theaters in the downtown area are going to be reborn. The Stanley, who we've been, which we've been talking about in the last few minutes, is going to be reborn as the Benetum, named for one of these great philanthropic families in this effort. Here are some of the sketches of what they wanted the Stanley to become. And that's the price tag, $43 million it's going to take to renovate the Stanley and to create the Benetton, which is going to open for the first time in 1987. Opening night, that's the program. Here we have it today. This, the front of the Benetton. I'm sure many of you have been down there for the Broadway series, if nothing else, which has been just a gigantic hit in the city of Pittsburgh for many, many years now. And every year uh, sells out almost the entire season series. 2,880 seats in the Benetton. I want, again, uh, just one of these gigantic theaters, but most of those seats are filled for nearly every performance. This fascinates me as someone who was involved in the theater for many, many years backstage. Uh, I was never a performer, but helped out with musicals in my high school for over a decade and a half. The backstage at the Benham, believe it or not, from the basement levels up through the stage and then on up into the rafters and where the lights are hung is nine stories high. Nine stories the stage levels from below what you see to what you see to what's above what you see. Just an incredible complex. Here you can see it from the view of the balcony. And of course, the lights are just gorgeous. All of the decoration there is phenomenal. The big hit with the Benetton, of course, that catches people's attention as you're sitting there is the chandelier. It weighs 4,700 pounds. It's two and a half tons. Needless to say, they don't change the lights very often at this two and a half ton chandelier because you have to put scaffolding up there to get to it. You're not gonna lower that down to change the light bulbs. And you're also not gonna do it very often because there are 50,000 bulbs in that chandelier. When they do change it, they change it all at once. It doesn't matter whether the light bulb's still working or not. They're going to change it. So all new light bulbs at one time. That kind of backstage stuff just fascinates me. In a kind of an homage to the previous incarnation of this theater, the old Stanley Marquis is actually on the side street of the Benetton. Many of you probably, if you've been down there, have noticed that before. And perhaps some of you weren't aware of what it what it refers to, but it was the original incarnation of this building, the Stanley Theater. The Fulton is another one downtown Pittsburgh that has gone through various lives. 1930, that was the name that it was known by. By the 1960s, as you can see, it uh, certainly looks a lot less alive in that photograph than it did in the previous one. But in 1968, it is the showplace for a new and soon to be legendary film. This is a photograph of the original showing of Night of the Living Dead. This is actually later on, uh, George Romero had a series there that they're showing all at one time. But in any case, the original Night of the Living Dead was shown in this theater. We have 1,727 seats in the Fulton. It is now reincarnated as of 1991 as the Byam Theater downtown and 1300 seats. A little bit of a smaller venue and so you can have smaller acts that can perform live in this setting, which is one of the great things about the cultural district in Pittsburgh. There are so many different options down there for different types of entertainment and it really does make it a must-see place to go. 
talking more on a national level around this time uh, this is near the end of the age of the great picture palaces that we've been talking about 1929 the san francisco fox was built by that company i referred to earlier one of the the largest and the greatest of the picture palaces you can see an interior shot on the right and an exterior shot on the left kind of get a sense of the scale of that building here's another interior shot of the theater 1929 not a good time to be building a gigantic movie theater the fox is not going to survive very long this is the main auditorium in 1929 that's what it looked like 4651 seats in this theater a true mammoth venue one of the things the fox did that was unique and new movie theaters discovered food as a way to make money probably maybe uh, around the time of the depression they were looking for ways to try and increase their their intake of cash and so now something that would have been unheard of earlier people didn't want to even conceive of eating food how pedestrian would that be but now it was okay because there's nothing in the world of concessions that makes more money than popcorn it is the largest money making food anywhere in the world probably uh, the return on popcorn for the cost of actually the the corn that you pop is somewhere in the thousands of percent what you cost versus what you actually ask someone to pay for it so they caught on real quickly that this is how you're going to make money but the styles are changing at this point and people aren't interested in these gigantic gilded age almost edwardian theaters anymore uh, we have a new age and new designs in the theaters this is an art deco era the 1920s and 30s and so the stage uh also changes the theaters change this is a man who is going to develop some of the great theaters of the art deco period alexander pantages and this theater that he built in 1930 that you can see on the left is going to be one of 84 that he will eventually build and own Probably the most famous of them, though, the one that's in Los Angeles that was pictured previously. And here you see a daytime view of it. This is the Pantages, still exists in Los Angeles, still open. Here's an interior shot, what it looks like inside. And you can see that the decor is a little different. This is where you get into the Art Deco, where there's waviness and there's geometric shapes. And it's not that frilly stuff that you saw in the earlier era. This gives you a better, uh, a really, really good view of what the style is on the interior of these types of theaters. Again, we're talking about the Pantages here. And a view from the stage, looking back. The ceiling, not so much different than the ones we were just looking at in the Benidorm and the redesigned theaters of Pittsburgh. So here's where you're kind of getting that from. This is where the, the ceilings of those theaters kind of originated with the Art Deco style. The seats also are much less ornate if you look at them. From 1949 to 59, this theater in Los Angeles actually hosted the Academy Awards. And I was really happy to find that photograph to illustrate this. So not nearly the mammoth production it is today, but nevertheless, pretty important in the Hollywood scene. 2,703 people can get into that theater and see whatever it is that they have that night. Pantages still operating. There's the flyer for the 2018 and 19 season. Looks very much like the Benidorm. Traveling shows. 1932, probably the greatest of all of the Art Deco theaters in the world, Radio City Music Hall. I have yet to be able to get into this building, but it is on my bucket list next time I'm in New York with any kind of a tour. I'd love to go on one that would uh, attend something in Radio City Music Hall. As I said, in New York City, it is in the heart 
of the theater area, part of the Big Apple scene of entertainment in New York, the place to be. Here's an interior shot of the theater looking down from one of the higher levels of the staircase and an exterior shot of the street level. This is an absolutely dynamite photograph of the interior from the very back of the balcony section of Radio City Music Hall. And you can see right there how the Art Deco is so much different than the earlier theaters that we saw from the 18, uh, from the 19 teens through the 20s. An easier picture to have then of the balconies. You can see the, the several different levels at Radio City Music Hall, not just two balconies, but actually three different levels, which allows you to have just so much larger an audience. And of course the acoustics, uh, that's the reason for the shapes that you see there, are just phenomenal. 6,000 people can get into the Radio City Music Hall. It's the largest of all of the picture palaces that we will look at this evening. And here you see a view of someone on stage. And again, you can get a sense of the scale when you look at the people down there on the stage. Much, much larger than what we're kind of used to here in Pittsburgh with the Benetton. The backstage area, all the complex technology. And like the Benenum, this would be several stories high on the backstage areas. Just another view showing the baffles and different ways that you're going to adapt the theater while you're setting it up uh, for whatever the production is and the sound effects. Most famous performers at this theater, of course, are the Rockettes, Radio City Music Hall Rockettes. Can't go without mentioning them and their Christmas show every year. By 1940, theaters are changing dramatically. And here you have a much more simple design. Uh, the money isn't there anymore. And so when you're building new ones, you really have to build a very simple structure as much as possible. And so there's kind of a whole new modern style, you might say, beginning in the 1940s. That's the uh, Elder Elberton Theater in Elberton, Georgia. An interior shot, again, very, very plain, not that decorative wall type decor. A little bit of the Art Deco up there in the front, but very simple and relatively inexpensive. Seats not nearly as sumptuous looking as what we've seen before. So what is it that's going to bring about the, uh, the collapse, you might say, of the Picture Palace era in American cinema? Well, beginning in 1932, people start discovering the idea of going to a theater outside, a drive-in. These didn't catch on right away, but they will slowly build an audience until after World War II, when the flight of people to the suburbs after the war is going to really accentuate and, and accelerate this effort to build drive-ins that people can take their cars and go to. 1947, the suburbs. This is one of the key things that's going to bring down the theaters of the time period that we're talking about. This is, of course, your view here of the first of the great suburban sprawl towns, you might say, of America. <clears throat> Pardon me. This is Levittown outside Philadelphia, the very first suburb. Television, beginning in 1951. People can have movies in their own home. Why go out to the theater? And of course, the multiplex. This is really kind of the nail in the coffin of the theater that we've been talking about here. Many, many theaters in one building. So land values are the last of the reasons why these theaters are simply going to go out of existence. Most of them do not survive the time period 
that we're talking about the 40s and 50s because the value of the land that they're sitting on is too great. Here's 1956, 10 commandments at the drive-in. I can remember going to something like that with my parents. The Paradise, 1928, one of the great palace theaters in Chicago. 3,612 people could get into the Paradise. By 1956, that's the Paradise. It is a field of grass. That's all that's left. Pulaski Road in Chicago. It's been torn down and there's nothing there. The Roxy, one of the famous New York theaters built in 1927, 6,000 plus people could get in the Roxy. Gloria Swanson on the poster there was one of the great stars who performed at the Roxy. 1960, Gloria Swanson is in that photograph standing in the wreckage of the Roxy Theater during the middle of the demolition of that theater. She's there in that photograph. So what a contrast, the Roxy is gone. The Strand is a local theater. Talk uh, just for the last part of our program here about some of the local theaters that have survived and kind of been reborn. They're not big, but they're popular enough to keep the lights on. 1914, the Strand was built in Zelianople. The Sapienza family had a store located right beside it. This is in, again, Zelianople, and you can see the Strand in the background of the top picture during a parade, and on the bottom, illustration, Craig Nelson, Poltergeist, relatively recent, back in the 1950s, 60s. I can remember Craig Nelson can picture him. The Strand falls on hard times, like many of the other theaters, especially during the age when some of the industries in Western Pennsylvania were beginning to also suffer hard times. 1986 to 2001, this is what the Strand looked like. From 2001, though, to 2009, the city of Zelianople and the, many of the families of Zelianople that had a little bit of money to invest in the town decide that they want to revitalize the downtown area and they're gonna rebuild the Strand. It's gonna cost two and a half million dollars, which for a small town like Zelianople is a lot of money, but they're gonna successfully bring this theater back to life. And there you see it when it opened uh, that year in 2009. Uh, this happened to be the Grand Budapest Hotel that was showing at the Strand there, but uh, that's when it opened. I'm not sure if that movie's from that year, but this is what it looked like. It looks like today. So it's it's uh, doing great business, some live performances as well. They can do both at the Strand. It holds 300 people, which is just enough for a small town to support. Here we have Gene Wilder and Young Frankenstein on the marquee. A lot of older movies sometimes are very popular at these places. What you're looking at right here is what almost killed the movie theater the individual movie theaters, and the drive-ins. This is a digital projector. They're extremely expensive. And for instance, we have a local theater right near where I live here on Route 8 called the Starlight. It used to be known as the Pioneer. This drive-in nearly went out of business. Uh, very, very struggle, uh, a great struggle for a few years because they couldn't afford to upgrade the equipment. And all of the movies were becoming more and more uh, digital in the way they were distributed. And they didn't have a digital projector. These things cost over $100,000, I understand. And so the Starlight was fortunately reborn because they were able to, to find enough money to purchase these projectors one at a time. And now they have three screens here. And that's the only way you can make these work to have multiple screens at a drive in. The Lamp is another one of the local theaters that is now reborn, if you will, live performances and also movies. It's in Irwin, PA. This theater goes back to 1921, but again, it is now available and open for business for small theater goers, audiences. Here you see it during the day 
when it's not being used and some of the uh, stage there area you can see how big it is this is a view from the stage looking back at the lamp uh, we've been to this one it's a very nice little venue i think we saw a tribute band there this is the palace this is a little bit larger uh, the, uh, this uh, theater happens to be in greensburg pa and again like the others it both uh, it does both movies and live performances comes from the time period of 1926 but again now been revitalized does local musical performances such as the one you're looking at here along with movies and live theater 22 years the arcadia was celebrating when this picture was taken as part of their promotion the Arcadia is in Winbur, PA, and I've also been to this one, a nice little venue. Here you see the interior of this theater, a little bit bigger than the Strand. And the final one that we're going to talk about briefly is the Cascade. It was originated in 1907, it was actually built. It was a family theater. These four brothers were the ones who constructed the Cascade. Uh, immigrant family, they had come from Europe. This is second generation. And these young men were so successful, this is actually a picture of them later in life. They were so successful that they decided to move from their original home in Newcastle, PA, and strike out for where they felt they could really make a big time uh, life for themselves out in California. 1923, they pack up and move. This is the Warner Brothers. Many people don't realize the Warner Brothers actually started here in Western Pennsylvania. All of you probably recognize the symbol now of Warner Brothers pictures, but they went to Hollywood in 1923. The Cascade has been rebuilt and part of it, uh, th this is in stages, but part of it's a museum, and eventually they are going to finish it as a theater where people can go and actually see films. But this is what it looked like in 2016, and you see the historic marker out in front. Warner Brothers, of course, was famous for these cartoon characters. If you're of a certain age, like I am, I can definitely, one of my greatest childhood memories is to sit in front of the television black and white at the time, that my parents had in our living room and spend my whole Saturday morning watching hour after hour of the Looney Tunes, all those famous legendary characters created by the Warner Brothers right there. And with that, I will invoke the name of one of these characters, Porky Pig, who will tell us all that that's all, folks. I am the History Hobo. Thank you so much for your kind attention this evening. And we'll open things up here for questions. I'm going to stop sharing. And let me end my show here so I can see the screen. And uh, Katie, I'm going to turn things over to you if you see anything in the chat or yeah, we did just get one in the chat. It said, have you visited the Magic Lantern Museum in Meadville? I have not. I will write that name down. I didn't know that that was there. Okay. I love these old theater. Magic Lantern. In Meadville. Meadville. That's interesting because our oldest daughter actually went to Allegheny College and I, it never occurred to me. I probably drove pie at a number of times, but no, we haven't been there. I'm taking notes just in case anybody comes up with another good idea like that. Any other questions? I'll do my best to answer. Comments, memories. One of the things I like to do with my programs is give you that sense of nostalgia for days gone by. For some of us, more days gone by than others, but nevertheless, it's kind of fun to think about all of those things that used to be, and some of them are still there. I'm big into historic preservation. I love it when we can keep these old things and revitalize them. 
give it another couple of minutes. If yeah, anyone does minutes. have a question, you can type that in the chat or you should be able to unmute if you'd like to unmute. Yeah, that. please do. Yeah, I didn't even think to say that. Please unmute. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to comment. This is Pauline Edison. When I compare the architecture of those buildings that you've just shown and the architecture that we get round about now, we're just giant boxes. It's so disappointing. It's discouraging somewhat that we don't put that kind of money. I suppose there was a lot more money in those days that they could afford to spend it, but now that we just don't put it in. And once I heard that the stage at the Benedon was the third biggest stage in the country. Have you heard that? I didn't run into that, but I'm going to mark that down and I'll confirm that because, because I can just add that well, to one, my the little comments. One was, this one in New York, the second one I heard was the music school at Indiana University in Bloomington, oh. of all things, and then the Benedon. So I mean, it is gigantic as far as the stage is. goes. Yes. Colossal. Yeah, cool. right. But yeah. uh, only one, one or two bigger. Yeah, that's all. Really? Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, I, I do agree with your comment. I find myself, especially in the last few days, because I've been giving several presentations and I see all these old old buildings, I find myself looking, probably shouldn't be paying attention to the buildings, I should be watching the road. But as I'm driving through towns and, and there's older sections of the towns, I'm finding myself starting to look at the buildings, especially at the second, third floors. And I'm thinking to myself, you couldn't probably afford to do that. Even houses used to like brickwork mm -hmm. used to be very ornate around windows. And they would have the, the around the top of the roof, underneath the roof, you'd have yeah, the, you, the woodwork. That Union Trust building, where if you look right at the top, I mean, it is beautiful. The further up you look, the better it is. Mm -hmm. And the windows are all in proportion. As the windows go up, they get a little bit smaller, so it looks correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing the thought and the money, as you yes. said, that went into some of those structures. That's why I love, and I, I would thoroughly recommend to, to any of you who want to do these kind of things about the uh, Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation that I belong to. I've taken several of the tours that they give uh, to Pittsburgh, downtown walking tours. And they are worth every dime. <laughs> They're not even that expensive to begin with. But you really get a sense of thinking about what's above you and what's out of sight when you're driving through the city. And it's really worth walking down the sidewalk and actually looking up and seeing it, what's there. It's fascinating. Thanks. Anyone else want to share any of those stories? All right, well, I was going to say I um, while well, you were talking did a quick search and I can't find exactly where in the list, but I found several sites talking about how the Benedum is among the top 10 largest. But I can't find like a list of all of this. I'll be curious mm -hmm. if you find that. Doing, yeah, I know. Actually, actually like digging in and doing some research on it. Right. I, I know I, I did come upon that when I was doing the research and, and reading about the Benedum. Of just how gigantic that's why i put it in there that's in nine stories because mm -hmm. that is just colossal uh, to imagine that you know the theater is taking up that space it's not floors of apartment buildings it's it's the theater yeah. <laughs> it's nine stories high <laughs> so yeah a big space great place to see a play oh yeah i assume many of you have been down into pittsburgh and gone to some of those places all right. Well, if there's no other questions, I mean, I'll hang around for a couple more minutes just in case. But otherwise, I thank you very much for your attention. I am the History Hobo. There is a website. There's a Facebook page. Please feel free to check it out. My oldest daughter and I are in the process of updating it. So it's not completely up to date, but it's uh, good enough to get a sense of what's out there. If you are interested in these kind of programs and you want to contact me, I'd be glad to talk to you. So thanks very much for your attention. And I hope everybody learned something new tonight and if nothing else, enjoyed the show. Thank you. It was interesting. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>